here at the Sainsbury Laboratory, my research is, is focused on a, a couple different aspects of plant biology. So I'm very interested in plant development. I'm interested in plant stress adaptation, environmental changes, so to speak, how plants respond to that. And I think there's a, a real nice precedence here in the Botanic Garden where the Sainsbury Lab is located. One thing that's very, um, I wouldn't necessarily say unique about plants, but I think it's very important or special about plants, is that uh, they're sessile organisms. So essentially where they sit down or where they, uh, they grow uh, is essentially where they're going to be for the rest of their lives. And there's a lot of important developmental and stress adaptations, environmental changes that they have to cope and deal with. So in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, one emerging topic of biology that's been quite relevant both to human health and plant biology is something called epigenetics. And this is the idea that you have a basic DNA sequence, your A, G, C, and T, and this has been known about for an extremely long time. Uh, Watson and Crick did a lot of fundamental research in this. But since then, there's sort of another layer of information that's been discovered that's very important to how this uh, A, G, C, T is actually being read and understood. So you have this uh, information that's being encoded above uh, the DNA sequence, so the A, A G, C, and T. Uh, and you, this can be thought of as decorations to the DNA, so modifications that can be put on. And these modifications can be placed for various reasons, for either developmental reasons, so you have different cell types, they're going to have different modifications. And these modifications can also be put on in response to certain things. So there's a, a growing amount of evidence that actually uh, stress conditions, environmental changes can actually induce these different types of marks. And these marks, I think, are, they're very special and quite important because they have the capacity both to change uh, the phenotype of the organism, how the organism is actually responding, how it's growing, and these changes can actually be put on and they can also be removed. So that's quite important. Whereas changes to the DNA, it's not possible, uh, at least in an organism's lifetime, to, to change the A, G, C, and T. So here we have three varieties of tomato plants, a uh, cherry tomato plant and then two uh, full-size tomato plants. And what we'd like to do here is graph them together. Uh, so this is a very ancient technique and it's relatively simple and straightforward and I'll, I'll go ahead and graph these guys. So typically we do these grafting experiments seven days after germination. So the plants are extremely tiny, they're only a couple millimeters long. So we're going to do something called a V-graft. So put a notch there. Notch there. So now the idea is pretty simple. We just essentially want to stick the ones together like this. And we can stick them together like that. There we go. So I've just grafted these two tomato plants to each other. Uh, one is the uh, cherry tomato and the other one is our standard variety of tomato. So now essentially we've generated a chimeric organism. So it's now two genotypes, uh, one genotype in the shoot, another genotype in the root, uh, that have now been grafted to each other. Now why would we want to do this? So one thing that's very interesting from a scientific point of view is that having a chimeric organism allow us to look at molecules that can move from one part of the plant to the other. So you can imagine a molecule would be produced in the shoot of this plant could move to the roots and then have an effect. And because these organisms now have a different genome from one another, we can monitor which, organis or which molecules appear in the roots that are not normally produced there because they're being produced in the shoot. We could take a plant that was no longer producing specific types of RNAs that we thought were important for uh, these epigenetic processes. So when we did this experiment, we actually could discover that about 70% of the RNA that was being, you could, you could think of it as the mutant lacking all the RNA, and then when we did this graph, we could restore about 70% of these small RNAs. And with that as well, we could actually restore these epigenetic marks. So I think this was actually quite a nice demonstration because we could show that one part of the plant could produce a signaling molecule. This molecule could then move long distances through the plant, and then it could direct epigenetic information at specific regions. The RNAs can move from the shoots into the roots and have an effect to change the gene expression. Uh, importantly though, I think these epigenetic marks can also probably go the other direction. So you can imagine a signal might be produced in this leaf here. If it gets attacked by a pathogen, it's going to produce a signal which could then move up to the plant and then in some ways perhaps prime defenses uh, or get this plant ready for these sort of environmental stresses such as this pathogen attack or maybe it's detecting salinity in the roots. 
And not only do these epigenetic marks have the capacity to then prime the plant or get the plant ready and better to respond to these types of stresses, but there's also the potential that these epigenetic marks could then go into the flowers, be inherited into the seeds, and then the progeny of this plant could then be better adapted to the stress. So what you can actually imagine is that a, a plant, for instance, would be growing in a certain environment that would find quite stressful, and it could actually modify these decorations to the DNA. It can change its epigenetic marks, uh, things like uh, histone modifications, DNA methylation, and it can change these marks in response to the stress. Uh, and the thing that's, I think, becoming more and more apparent now is that some of these marks can actually be inherited to subsequent generations. So a plant that would be growing under, for instance, uh, heat stress, pathogen stress, uh, could actually change the modifications to the DNA and then inherit these modifications to its progeny, so both to its children and to its grandchildren. And there's extremely good evidence now that both the children and grandchildren are then more resistant to that original stress. So they become more resistant to heat stress or to pathogens. And I think this has very important implications for biology. I mean, both in terms of how plants are responding and adapting to stress, so in terms of crop engineering, um, thinking about the biology of plants, uh, and it also seems like some of these principles could be relevant to humans. How we would be living, uh, our lifestyles, uh, could actually be what we're doing in our lifetime, could potentially be influencing how our children uh, and grandchildren, how their epigenome, so to speak, uh, is being modified and affected.